Hello, welcome to Toffee TV. I'm delighted to say I'm joined in the studio today by Everton and AS Roma fan and expert, Tom Woods. Tom, thanks for coming in to, uh, no to have a chat with me. me. Right, come on. Give, I'm, I'm curious. Give me your background to AS Roma. Um, well, it, it's, a, it, it's a bit odd, but I, I, I am an Everton fan, like, you know, my local team. Um, growing up, season ticket holder, and yeah, I don't know what I did in the past life, but obviously it's <laughs> pretty terrible to have that fate. In in the Roma connection comes in because growing up, my great auntie did some research into like our family tree and found out that we had some Italian ancestry. So I, growing up, I was always like a fan of Italian football. I had the uh, I think for me tenth birthday, got like the Italy kit and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And uh, I, I one of my favourite players was Totti growing up and. As I got a bit older, um, I wanted to go to Italy with my mates to, to watch a game of football. And we were we flew to Milan and we were meant to go and watch Inter versus Napoli on the, the Saturday. The week before, they changed the, the game uh, to the Friday night, so we missed that. And the next best thing was Atalanta-Roma on, uh, on the Sunday. So we ended up going to watch that game, saw Totti score. And uh, I just sort of started following Roma's results after that. Mm -hmm. And I was, at Man uh, I was at university in Manchester at the time. And I noticed there was a meet-up of AS Roma North UK fans. Now, there was only four of us there on the day for the very first one. Yeah. But we we uh, tried to look somewhere to watch the game. Nowhere had it on, so we were sat in a uh, in a bar, all huddled around one of my mates' uh, phones, watching yeah, AS Roma lose to Villarreal 1-0 in the, the, the second leg of a Europa League tie, which we won the first leg 4-0, so wasn't it a complete disaster and from there yeah we've gone to uh, as part of AS Roma North UK we've gone to a lot of like European away games mm. I've been to Rome a few times to follow the team obviously bought shirts and become invested in AS Roma so uh, yeah now I've got two teams to let me down not just not, <laughs> not just the one the weekend now it's a, it's an I mean is it has it grown has Roma North UK grown? It has, to be fair. We've yeah. got, um, I think it's like over 50 sort of members now. Oh, so okay. you pay a little, when you join, you pay a little membership fee. It's like £15. Mm. And we give you a, a scarf, a little membership card. And the way they do the, the memberships, it, the sorry, supporters clubs in Italy, mm. like if you're a supporters club member, you can get 10% off at the club shop and stuff oh, like that okay, if you yeah, physically yeah. walk into a shopping room uh, and show them your card. And it's kind of easier to get tickets to the game. So we've been able to go to some European away games because we're in the supporters club. If I just tried to get it independently, oh, okay, difficult yeah. to do because it's obviously very limited tickets. But no, it's a good, good group of uh, lads and girls. And uh, yeah, we meet up sort of, e even if we can't go to the games, we'll meet up in typically Manchester because it's kind of like the unofficial capital of the North West. I, sh I shouldn't say that really. <laughs> no, you shouldn't say it. But it's, yeah. it's, it's easier for people to, to get there to from, get to. from all over from, I don't know, we got a couple of people from Newcastle and Scotland and stuff. Mm. So it's easier for them to, to get to Manchester. And we meet up there, yeah, to, to watch the games um, when we can't actually go to them ourselves. Brilliant. Mm. Interesting, interesting. So I guess when this story first came out about the freaking group. We'll get on to the freaking group with AS Roma and how it all, how it's gone, how it began, how it's gone and all that. But just fit, what were your first thoughts when you heard that Dan Freakin was interested in buying your other, your main team, obviously, yeah. being a season ticket holder, uh, Everton? Yeah, it was it, unbelievable, really. Uh, we, 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 we were talking about this with my dad the other day, and he, he couldn't believe it that like, I could have picked any team to support, and, <laughs> mm. and, and you know, unless I was a, a can fan. Yeah, um, of course, yeah. I could have picked any team to support, and it's just unbelievable that the, the two of them uh, have combined to, to pick, uh, to, to be owned by the, the same fella or, or the same ownership group. Mm. I, I'm excited in terms of Everton and Roma being together uh, in the same ownership group. and. I was on the wind up in the group chat, the AS Roma North UK group chat on, on WhatsApp, because one of the lads is uh, he's also a Newcastle fan. And he has this weird irrational hatred, you know, like some of them do of, of Everton now. Mm. Don't know whether it's driven by Pickford or this weird like Twitter thing where anything Everton goes wrong for Everton, all the Newcastle fans jump on it. He's not I think happy. it's with Rafa Benitez as well, I think. Could, but... could be, but he, he, he's not happy with is it at all. So <laughs> I was just on the wind up and, it, and it, you know, I found it quite amusing in that aspect. But if I'm being honest, I really don't like the multi club ownership model mm. I'd, I'd rather every team had one ownership group yeah. that was trying to do the best for them and, and with this I mean if I could pick any two teams in the world to, to be joined together it would be Everton and Roma mm. but obviously there are some concerns over the multi-club thing and, and you know one club being sort of ranked higher than in, in the owner's eyes uh, than the other. But I think what's good is Everton and Roma are two similarly sized teams and I think fans of, of both sides will kind of criticise me for that but I think 
Roma have a bigger global fan base, but Everton have more history and trophies. Mm -hmm. And obviously just playing in the Premier League um, is a massive prestige and financial value mm -hmm. in itself. So I kind of mix the motions, I suppose. But like you say, if, if anyone's going to join together, um, Everton and Roma for me. And that, that's obviously, you know, I'm, I'm happy. And also it gets us out there. The, uh, the Maya with Farhad Mashiri and 777 and all that. And I think there's a little bit of relief there. So although personally I don't like multi-club ownership, mm -hmm. I can take solace in the fact that we're not going to be owned by loads of cowboys who are going to drive us even further into the ground than we already already mm -hmm. are. Yeah. So just talking off camp before we started, just discussing the freak and group or damn freak and taking over Roma and you were saying it was first, it started to get underway sort of like 2019, the back end of 2019, but it wasn't actually completed until the summer of 2020. Obviously, COVID came in and, and changed changed everything, didn't it? But they took over in 2020. So what was... when they, I've, I've seen, obviously, read bits and pieces about where Roma were, how they were performing. They didn't sell out before the Freegan group took over, and now it's... 57 sell out to something on the run and that so therefore that says that says some positive things yeah. but just give us a little bit of history about them taking over and what has what has happened sort of in the time that they've had so evertonians can can try and make some comparisons i think yeah so uh, when when they took over uh, roma had an owner called jim palotta and i think growing up he had like history of being a, a roma fan he was an italian american he he wanted to make roma great again so to speak but yeah. he I don't think he quite had the, the know-how and the finances to, to match that ambition mm. and I think Dan Friedkin and the Friedkin group identified Roma a bit like Everton as a sleeping giant you know yeah. someone who could be a commercial powerhouse uh, within European football but the potential wasn't being realised so just before they took over, there was a period where Monchi came in. I don't know if you know who yeah, he is, yeah. but yeah. he was the sporting director at Sevilla. Came to Roma with a lot of promise, having built you know Sevilla into multiple-time Europa League winners. Um, and he was an absolute disgrace. If I'm being honest, he signed terrible players for inflated money. Patrick Schick and Javier Pastore and... Stephen and Zonzi, you know, players that maybe on paper looked like they were going to be good, but they just never turned out. And mm. he got sacked just before the the Freakins took over. He's now sporting director at Aston Villa. He is, and he's doing well again. So maybe yeah. it's just me being a curse in the team I sport. <laughs> this fella goes who's meant to do well and, and does terribly. But the Freakins kind of, when they first come in, had to undo a lot of the, the damage that he'd done. So yeah. had a lot of players, a bit like Everton on inflated wages, um, maybe not, the, the, the team was underperforming commercially, as you mentioned before, um, and they've kind of had to strip all of that out, but do so whilst kind of matching the ambitions of the football club, because, you know, it's one thing to reduce wage bills and reduce transfer fees, but then if you're replacing them with nobodies yeah. and, and players that aren't of the standard, you're not going to grow the interest or you're not going to get fans on side, you're only going to damage the brand further, so there's a bit of a, a balancing act there, but in terms of on the pitch, it's, it has been a mixed bag. Obviously, people point immediately to the Europa Conference League victory, and that was massive. It was Roma's first ever major European honour. Um, obviously, it was a from a feel good factor coming out of COVID, being able to go to the games again. It was good to be able to go to the quarter final, the semi final. You know, see Roma um, win a competition which they hadn't done uh, in over. I think it's 14 years, something like that. The Coppa Italia, 2007, 2008, was the, was the last time they won anything. So the fan base was getting a bit restless and it was nice to put that to bed with the, the Conference League win. And also in Europe as well, performing well, got to uh, three Europa League semi-finals, qualified for the final last year. Mm. Unfortunately, Anthony Taylor was behind the, uh, a loss for, for mm. Roma, didn't give a handball in the last minute, which would have gifted Roma a penalty and hopefully the the, the win from there. But um, European football has been great, domestically not so good. Mm. Uh, I said to you, like we were talking off camera before, the Serie A is a bit easier to qualify for the Champions League than you know it is in the Premier League. There's not uh, as many clubs that are fi financially powerful as there are in the Premier League. So the fact that the three kings in the six years have never broken in to the, the top four, now the top five in Italy, mm. has been a bit of an issue. Now, as personally... I actually don't mind in that they seem to be performing pretty well in the Europa League and the Conference League. Yeah. So there's more of a chance of winning it, but for financial matters, you do want to be qualifying for that 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 Champions League. So a, a bit of a mixed bag. Domestically, not so good. In the actual European competitions they qualify for, really impressive. Mm -hmm. um, done a good job. Signed some big name 
players, so the likes of Tabala, Lukaku, uh, obviously got Mourinho in who started off well and then tapered off towards the end. Uh, but I think where and what I'm looking forward to with the Freakins taking over Everton is the off the field stuff, the commercial stuff. So. Like you mentioned, they weren't filling the grounds. I think I first went in 2016 uh, to watch uh, in to Rome to watch Roma play in the Europa League uh, group stage, and there was about 30,000 people there. The stadium holds about 78,000 or something like that. So you can imagine the amount of empty seats that there were. Yeah. It wasn't a good look. You, you couldn't find there was no official merchandise on sale. The only time at the game you could buy any merchandise was walking up and independent vendors selling stuff there was no money going into the club's pocket and nice, yeah. that's like the very basics yeah. it very much felt like you were going to watch Roma play at a neutral venue oh. now they do share it with Lazio mm. but it doesn't mean that on a match day you can't dress it in Roma colours oh, and make yeah. it feel like home and the, the Freakins have come in and they've completely revamped the match day experience so now they have a club shop on site, so when you go to the game, you can buy a shirt, you can buy a scarf, you can make money that way. The food and drink offerings better. The 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 process to buy tickets is easier. You don't need a membership now. If you're a tourist, you can just rock up. If there's tickets available on the day, you can buy them. I think the um the actual experience itself in terms of pre-game, you've got like music playing, light shows. When the players run out the tunnel, there's big LED screens and smoke and stuff like that. It's very much an Americanized version yeah. of a match day experience, but if you look at the NFL, which is one of the most profitable, the most profitable sports league in the world, it's almost like they've looked at those American sports leagues. What, how can we adapt that to football? And they've installed it into Roma. And now, if you go to a game, I last went to Roma in, in 2022, it very much feels like it's more catered to getting money out of fans or to monetizing the fan base. And it's not 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 in a malicious way, but it mm. just in a way that will hopefully set the club up for future success and an increase in revenue which you know recent financial figures 25 percent uptick in net profit 17 yeah. percent increase in revenue you know these are numbers driven by a more corporate minded entity off the field um, and trying to monetize the fan base a bit better so hopefully when we go to Bramley Moor there'll be a better offering for fans regardless of you know whether you're a season ticket holder or you're a tourist just visiting for the first time yeah I mean all of that sounds very interesting. It's, it's something that Everton just simply haven't done. And I guess where we are with Rick Goodison this season, obviously, will be a, a totally different experience given it's the last one. But we are at our capacity with Goodison, even just match day revenue, projected revenues. You know, I think it's something around 19 million currently, and it'll probably more just on reserved, sort of like a real kind of low ball estimation it's up to 50 odd million so straight away an increase of like 30 odd million which and then if you start doing the stuff that they're doing and have done in rome again that link restarting it, it puts us in a better place we've you know we've had some bad times haven't we some real difficult times over yeah. the last few years and the psr stuff and all of that but that is really encouraging I know you're saying they haven't got the champions league and all that but they've still won a trophy been to the european final and another one there has been some improvements. It is what it is, isn't it? You, you hope that you give the manager the resources and he delivers. Jose Marino was a little bit upset, I think, when he was was let go. Yeah. He said that he don't know anything about football. Jose's like that, isn't he? He tends to have an 18-month grace period and then everything, the wheels start coming off, don't they? Because that's the kind of character he is. But with Rome, I guess, with them playing in that stadium... Dan Meester do them a stadium design he a did, long yeah, time yeah, ago. I'm not yeah. sure if it was the freaking group who employed them or if it was the, the previous yeah, owner. Yeah, pre, the previous yeah. Owner, yeah, so they've been trying to get that off the ground and Rome, you just can't get... You can't There's so them, much Rome. red tape in Italy. Yeah. It's not. I'm not saying it's straightforward here, mm. but it's a bit more easier to kind of regenerate an area of Dockland, which is disused, mm. compared to yeah, trying to get a, a stadium in Rome, which they've been trying to do for, for ages now. And, and like you say, that Dan, Dan Mice, he, he, he's the fella behind that. There's obviously a, a link there, which is which is good already. Mm. So hopefully they can find a, an appropriate site to build on, which I believe they're closer to doing. And I think the freaking group are, are working on that. Mm. Uh, maybe they can kind of, show what they will be doing with Everton Stadium and use that as like a That's case study course. as for why he should be able to to do the same in Rome. Yeah. It's got I mean, when you look at it, we obviously you, you touched on it before, the all the uncertainty and everything with Triple Seven and the stories were coming up. You're trying to you're trying to cut through and see what is scaremongering, what is real. 
and you'd always want to, you'd always think, hopefully it's not as bad as that and these are getting wildly reported. The interesting thing with this group is, and listen, there was, in the end, there seemed to be quite a few people in for Everton, and obviously we had AJ Bell and George Darlin, who were two Evertonians in with a certain investor. We had uh, Vats Munachian from, he was a London-based investor, but Evertonian, but he had other, you know, Saudi royal family members and all of this, you know, people and in char, you know, involved in the consortium. Then there was Vici, which was another wealthy consortium. And even though Dan Freakin had sort of been linked with it early, I was thinking that's sort of like the least likely one. We had John Texter, of course, who owns Crystal Palace, another American, who was very vocal about wanting Everton and it was a sleeping giant. So it did sort of come out the blue a little bit yeah. that the agreements had been done with Dan Freakin and he was the preferred, or the Freakin group were the preferred kind of bidders, if you like. Uh, and we've now entered into this period of uh, due diligence and that's underway. It's nearly two weeks underway now. So hopefully this will go quite quickly and, and be a straightforward process. But just looking at it from the perspective of what you've seen at Rome and where we are with the uncertainty with Triple Seven, what what do you think or what are you hoping the freaking group can do if they do, if you know, if all of this does come to fruition? It seems very positive, but let's just assume that it all gets passed and they become the new owners of Everton. What what have we seen at Rome that you think they'll try to do with Everton Football Club? Well, I don't necessarily know if they did this at Rome, but I'd like them to come in and review every position across mm. the board. So not just, you know, from the, the, the concourse to the boardroom. And because <laughs> yeah. I think everyone should do the do due, due diligence um, when taking over a football club. We've not performed well for however long, a decade Ever, and a half. Well, <laughs> my life, my lifetime anyway, I've never seen us win anything. But, but in terms of more recent times, mm. we've been massively underperforming. And I think I'd quite like to see them come in uh, and sort of review every position. If they can feel that they can make improvements anywhere, make those improvements. Mm. I, I think, uh, you know, people will be thinking about uh, talking like that, like the manager's position and stuff like that. You know, if they can identify a, a new manager, should they bring one in? Mm. Same with the director of football. Or, or do they feel like where they're sat right now, um, there's no one better under the current constraints? Mm. Um, I, I think... What what will, will hopefully expedite the process um, is seven 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 having been through the 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 rigmarole already. There's a framework there so yeah, they can they can get the uh, freaking group past it a bit quicker, and then they can sort of get to work. I don't know if it'll be the end of the summer, so they'll have a transfer window in in them or not. Uh, but we've already got some obviously business done early, which is is good news. And then more off the field stuff. I'm looking forward to seeing what they can do with Bramley more. So hopefully better revenue streams on match days but mm. giving it's not just about getting money out the fans but it's giving them a better offering yeah, yeah. you know at the moment you can get like a pie and a pint at Goods, <laughs> but is there any more kind of it'll be maybe more appealing to, to tourists but you know is there anything better we can get maybe like burger and hot dogs and that kind of thing it's not just all very sort of a, a, a vanilla a vanilla yeah. offering because I, I feel like it's difficult at Goodison because you are obviously limited um, but you know do I want a warm pint of Carlin or do I want a few beer choices? If, mm. I don't know if you've been to Spurs' new stadium, mm. but that should be something they're looking at, see what those guys have done and trying to replicate it at Goodison because it just feels now like maybe 10 years ago I would have had a slightly different opinion and I would have wanted to stay at Goodison, but the way the game's going, we need to improve revenue-wise and, and kind of get as much money out of a, a fan base as possible. And one thing I think the Freakins are really good at, if you look at what they've done with Roma, they've started to do a lot of communication now in the English language. Okay. So they're trying to expand the global mm. fan base. I think with Roma, it's already a bigger global fan base just because of the nature of the city of Rome and, and Roma's more recent history in the Champions League mm. and, and having a few more eyes on them. But they're obviously thinking bigger by not just putting everything in Italian, which is quite a small language, you know, it's used in, in, in what, Italy and Switzerland and not in many other places. So to, you know, using the English language in a lot of communications and on the club shop and in ticketing and stuff like that, it shows that they're thinking beyond the borders yeah. of Italy and they're thinking how, how, they, how they can make more money from Asia and America and South America and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. So I'm hoping they take a similar approach with Everton and try and grow that global fan base. I think on the pitch, it's going to be difficult to improve massively because of the constraints of FFP and PSR, which 
I hate and they're anti-competition and all the rest of it and, and that's a, a conversation for another day but I think they can give us a platform a bit like David Moyes did when yeah. he came into Everton he gave Everton a platform and then you just need maybe someone with a bit more money in a few years time to take us to, to the next level yeah. whether that's an investor whether that's I don't know uh, someone else another ownership group to come and take over that uh, a bit more wealthy but obviously you are hamstrung by by that uh, yeah. by those financial rules so the only way at the moment to kind of get around that issue is to improve your revenue streams is to, to make more money so that you're allowed to spend more and then get better players and improve yeah the pitch. It, it, i mean they are worth a few quid like you know to be fair that the He's worth alone and like triple what Machiri was worth, and the group's twelve billion. But obviously, the money, even if we were taken over by someone who had five hundred billion to spend, you can't spend it's it. Yeah, so yeah. it's like you just said, that is absolutely key. The key is revenue streams to go up, player trading. We're seeing it with every, we're seeing it with every club. You know, with, with Newcastle allegedly have got, even though it's nonsense when people say they've got unlimited money, they haven't, because no, no one's gonna go have all that money, are they? But they've got money to spend they can't Villa got a very wealthy owner can't spend the money so that's just where the rules are so you have to we have to be creative and if this group are you know Everton have done all right in a time where they haven't been creative you know if you yeah, look yeah. at Everton compared to other clubs we're still in the 1990s 1980s the way we're run as in how we're thinking there's people there who want to think bigger and better not being allowed to processes haven't been put in place and and then therefore everything flips back onto the team if the team is underperforming or not performing well because players have been sold from underneath us you know when you look back three or four years to the squad we had to the squad we've got now you know it's night and day you know, Carlo Ancelotti a couple of years ago you know we haven't now and that's that's the thing or three years ago so we have to address all of that they they're hopefully going to come in and give us a basis to do that. Things are already generally improving because they've had to in terms of revenue. And like I've just said, the, the actual match day revenue with conservative estimations is going to go up 30 odd million straight away by moving stadium. So then if you're getting Everton have just signed the biggest uh, kit manufacturer deal they've ever had because of the new stadium, as well so if they can then maximize all the other little wins then all of a sudden that revenue to spend on plays becomes better Everton will still have to recruit properly yeah, yeah and you still need to be doing sensible recruitment buy someone and, and have them for a couple of years and sell them on until you get your team level up i think evertonians are just looking forward to someone who's a grown-up to come in and put the club on like you said get the club on the right foot now they might start putting more money in as it goes along the line because when you're that wealthy, your money just keeps going up. So therefore, they might start putting more and more money in. I don't think it'll ever come to the stage where they're able to put, yeah, there's a billion, Kevin Thelwell, go and buy whoever you want, because I don't think the league will ever allow it, because it's, it's to stop Man City and to stop Newcastle and things like that. So we just need someone, like you said, to get us on a better footing, commercially more savvy, squeeze everything you can, not just out the fans, but yeah. out of... Uh, sponsors and out of name and rights for stadiums and all that well, these are obviously, obviously well versed. what's different in this case is unlike Mashiri, mm. it's not someone who's taken over a football club for the first time of course yeah so i'm hoping that they any got two, kind of they? Got two well they got yeah canon and, yeah. and roma so mm. hopefully they'll have been able to iron out the creases so yeah, to speak yeah. uh with with the other two clubs uh, and they've learned from any sort of initial mistakes they made or, or they can you know improve on what they've done so far with, mm. with the other two teams and apply that to everton in a in a way that's a you know it is better for the club mm. um and obviously the premier league's a different kettle of fish now like they've come into a couple of seasons ago they spent like 100 million euro 100 million pounds for mm. for roma um if 100 million pounds in the premier league doesn't stretch quite as far but in italy it's like you yeah, look like a big dog if you're spending that kind yeah. of money so um, th there's obviously slightly different challenges to navigate in England and like I say it's not going to be I don't think as forgiving as Serie A in terms of if you underperform you could find yourself right at the yeah. back of the queue you know yeah. as, as as we know uh, but they've obviously 
they've got more strings to the bow, I think, than like Farhad Mashiri. If you look at Roma's training kit, sponsored by Toyota, I think he owns or, or they own, is it Gulf States Gulf Toyota? States, Toyota yeah. So they, there's a bit of Middle Eastern connection there. Is it Aubergine Resorts they also own? Again, the back of shirt sponsor for Roma. So he's already got other businesses that hopefully he could bring, you know, or you know, yeah. or bring into Everton bit of sponsorship money uh, and up the revenue uh, in that respect as well whereas I don't think Mashiri had quite I know he was mates with Usmanov but himself and mm. what was under his control I don't think is as great as the resources that the Freakins have so mm. that's what I'm looking forward to and I think being being Americans we I don't like to think of the game in this way because you do like keeping all the traditions of football oh, and um, it's, it's the same with Everton but you've got to think like the Americans are really good at commercialising stuff and these guys are from the the land of the free. So yeah, they, they, they uh, hopefully they bring that now with them uh, and make Everton into well, what was what they see now as a sleeping giant into you know someone that can challenge. But the thing is, I mean, we've we've seen it over the park. I've made Liverpool's owners have took them to another level. To be fair, and yes, it's gone hand in hand with having a really good well, top manager and, and making good recruitment decisions, which is what has propelled Liverpool as well. A lot of American owners in the Premier League now, and, and it's just about doing things better. And I think Evertonians will get on board if that is create the revenue that goes back into the team that then makes the team better. I think we would all get on board with that. I think the problem, the problem is false promises. I don't think that's very good. I think not seeing that direct correlation back into the team, not seeing the club move in a direction. I think this Farad Mashiri's biggest mistake was not putting his own board in and not putting his own CEO in for me. If he'd have done that, I think the club would have been in a better place. I think you have to almost draw a line under everything and go, right, I'm the owner now and this is what we're doing. Newcastle did that, sacked everyone and brought their own people in. I'm not saying Everton should sack everyone, and, you know, but put their own people in and get it going that way. And We'll see, there's already stories about his son taking a director's role at Everton. I know that he's, he's on the board at Roma, isn't he? Yeah, and yeah. can as well, I believe. So, I mean, what do you know about him? I, if I'm being honest, not not a great deal. Yeah, yeah. Um, I th the, the kind of the business side of footballs is a bit kind of tedious to me. I'd, mm. I'd rather yeah, focus on absolutely. enjoying the game itself. What, what I do know is in the past couple of days, Roma have actually suspended their uh, chief commercial officer. I don't know if you've seen. All oh, right, OK. Because the, uh, the release from new merchandise with mm. Adidas... And they released like a tracky top. Oh, sure. And and it was like it's it's like Roma colours, red, uh, and, and like a, a yellow trim. Mm. And then for some reason they've got this big light blue panel on the front, which is obviously Lazio colours. Yeah. So they've now withdrawn that from sale. They've suspended the CCO because he's the fella who will have signed off on it from the club off. side. And uh, yeah, it's a bit of an interesting situation. But hopefully that's just a, a minor gaffe, and it, you know. But that's a ruthless. Any... That, but that's a ruthless decision. Yeah, yeah, and it shows he listened to the fans as well, because mm. there has been a little bit of uproar. Yeah, yeah. And they've taken the fans' concerns on board, uh, on board, and mm. acted based and on that. Uh, it'd be, I suppose, it'd be similar to Everton releasing a, a, a red track flag. Top with yeah, a big red square on the yeah, front. Yeah. Uh, it probably won't go down too well. But again, these are the kind of if they make their mistakes. You know, now when they come in to, to Everton, hopefully they'll have learned from yeah, that and they won't be repeating <laughs> the yeah the uh, that the kind of gaff. Again. Yeah. yeah. No, listen, it's gonna be it's gonna be really interesting, I think, and hopefully, like you said, hopefully the process will be a lot quicker because we've just been it's been dragged out with the other lot for bloody eight months, wasn't it? And well, the depression. You know now. You know, they need to provide X, Y, and Z mm -hmm. in order to take over the football club. Yeah. So those are the conditions 777 needed to meet meet them. And, mm -hmm. you know, you could. Should be good. Yeah, should be the owners of And there shouldn't club. really be any. Everton's finance has never even been out in the open now for a, for a while and under all kinds of scrutiny. So hopefully there shouldn't be any any other skeletons there and this can get passed off very quickly. It's going to be, it's going to be dead interesting to see how we go. Come in again. Coming again as we it. move forward, and, and we can hopefully it'll be a, a yeah. positive, a positive conversation. Yeah, uh, we'll absolutely, to have. absolutely. Uh, we'll well, I suppose the only the only uh, worry going forward now mm. is if they'll let Everton and Roma play each other in the Champions League. So. Well, let's. That is, that's a, I love the way you think. <laughs> I absolutely love the way you think, and mate, that's what it's all about. Let's <laughs> get to that place and let's have the conundrum when we get there it's going it. to be nearly interesting a big thanks for coming in let us know what you think in the comments section we'll be looking forward to the freaking group taking over at Everton so it's a smooth and quick process uh, make sure you like the video and subscribe if you haven't see you later